Minister Ong, thank you very much, and in particular for uh, reminding us of that fundamental relationship between uh, geoeconomics and geopolitics. Your references to the Belt and Road Project, uh, RCEP, and uh, other uh, trade engagement, and how that affects uh, the geopolitical relationships of the countries uh, engaged. And we at the IISS are uh, very mindful of this uh, relationship between geoeconomics and geopolitics, and that's why we have a director of geoeconomics uh, uh, running a, a program to examine those uh, linkages. And thank you, too, for reminding us, if I can again use this phrase, of those multiple minilateral arrangements that help to make uh, the Asia-Pacific secure, whether it's the FPDA or the uh, Malacca uh, Straits uh, Patrol. And I think one of the themes that has uh, emerged during this uh, Shangri-La dialogue is the uh, utility of uh, coalitions of the relevant, coalitions of the willing to uh, work together uh, to identify uh, specific uh, threats and collaborate in uh, meeting them. And the flexibility of our institutional arrangements is the thing that makes them often uh, effective. So uh, with that, I open the floor to uh, questions and comments, and I will privilege those who uh, have not yet had a, a chance to speak. Uh, and may I uh, first ask uh, Pedro Villagra Delgado from uh, Argentina to make his point. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to attend the forum. I think it's the first time Argentina is here, and that proves the importance that we give also to the Asia-Pacific region, which obviously has an impact, your security impacts on the rest of the world as well. Uh, I was happy to um, listen to the presentation of Mr. Eng, because when I was writing my notes to make the question, precisely the thing that I found that was missing is the link with the economics of security. And uh, what he mentioned, the importance of trade and finance and other developing uh, development, of course, infrastructure. We have to take into account that nowadays, all over the world, practically all the, uh, the threats to, are not state uh, threats, but non-state actors. And that has to do also with the linkage of lots of people that are disenfranchised by economic crises all over the place. And even by things that are not crisis, but that are an impending changing of the whole structure of production in the world in which thousands of jobs or hundreds of thousands of jobs are going to be disappearing, not because of any, anything but technology. So, and that will create more and more people, particularly of young ages and particularly in developing countries or in, in the deprived sectors of developed countries even, and those guys can, that could be a stimulus to go into uh, creating threats to security, terrorism, and you name it. The same happens with uh, the lingering effects for decades of some crises that never get resolved. I mean, they, we have things in the Middle East, and some of the crises that started in the 90s and still are going on. They have been for longer, going on for longer than the Vietnam War, for instance, or the Second World War. So those are uh, just to the panel to see how that could uh, be how can we use not to make them become a security organization, but search WTO, G20, ASEAN, or whatever other of these uh, um, uh, platforms that we have in the economic and finance world, multilateral, have to be cautious that this has an impact on security as well. We in the Americas were happy that we don't have any problems or potential problems between security clashes between states, but we do have criminality. I mean, normal crime, drug trafficking, and of course that has a, a severe impact in, in citizen security, which is not the same as defense. We, particularly in the Americas, we separate very clearly whatever is defense or whatever is security, but I wonder if the panel could share some views on this because I think these are critical to actually solve and make the question of security, the global question of security, effectively useful for the normal people in our societies. Muchas Thank gracias. You. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, could I ask uh, William Chung from Singapore and the IISS? William? Yeah. Um, Thank you, John. Um, I have uh, two questions for uh, Vice Minister Fomen, please. Um, now, um, Russia 
I said, uh, you said uh, very constructively that Russia wants to engage with the Asia Pacific region. And I do note Russia's activities in the ADMM Plus. And in a recent ASEAN Russia summit, it was uh, agreed that the East Asia summit will be a leaders led dialogue. My question for you is that uh, your so called uh, uh, pivot, if you, I can use that word, your pivot to the East looks more like a pivot to China because of all your extensive dealings with China, especially in the economic sphere. And when you talk about engaging with the Asia Pacific, Russia is also saying that you've rejected the decision at The Hague on the South China Sea that was released in July 2016. I do not see how you can say you support the rules-based order and yet say that you reject a decision at The Hague that is supported by many Asia-Pacific countries. My second question is about Taj. Um, perhaps you can tell us more about Russia's opposition to Taj because if you, if you see the definition of TARD, it's a, it's a terminal system. And uh, even if you say that the radars of TARD can reach in 2,000 kilometers, perhaps, into the Chinese mainland, I do not see how that affects uh, Russian interests. So maybe you can give us more light on that. Thank you. Thank you. And from uh, Brazil, uh, Braz Baruki. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, and also, uh, let me uh, thank Mr. Nick for raising uh, what is certainly one of the key geoeconomic issues of our time. But uh, my question is uh, to uh, the Russian deputy minister. I'd like to seek your views on the Chinese initiative of the One Belt, One Road. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I was at the Belt and Road Conference, and of course the second speaker after President Xi Jinping was President uh, Putin at the Belt and Road Conference, so there's uh, clearly uh, an interest uh, of Russia in Belt and Road. So uh, could I ask Christopher Nelson to uh, take the floor? Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, John, uh, for the invitation as always. You help us navigate dangerous waters without running onto the rocks, or at least not too, too directly. Um, I have two uh, questions that I hope will involve uh, all of this excellent panel. Um, on the TPP trade link, um, what is the assessment of uh, uh, Singapore and New Zealand on, on whether TPP 11 or what some of my Singaporean diplomatic friends call the organ harvest, uh, what is your sense of the success of this if the uh, Trump administration seems to remain hostile and or uh, mainly focused on NAFTA, uh, what hope might we have for that? And on the North Korea uh, thing, uh, especially General Fulman, thank you for, uh, for your remarks and, and your concerns. Um, on the THAAD uh, uh, question that our colleague just asked about, uh, what do you say when the Americans say, if you're so worried about THAAD, uh, what are you doing to stop the reason for that, which is the North Korean uh, progress towards an ICBM? Uh, you can't stop one without the other. And my question on that is at uh, yesterday's excellent uh, session uh, monitored uh, by Mark Fitzpatrick, uh, our Chinese friend General Yao discussed a possible dual freeze proposal uh, where uh, the North Koreans would presumably promise to freeze their their missile and, and nuclear weapon development in return for various free concessions from us. Uh, does Russia have a position on the idea of a freeze? How would Russia answer the American concern that a freeze would inherently accept North Korean existing nukes and existing missiles, which are a threat right now to the Russian Far East, uh, to the Chinese coast, to Japan and South Korea? So thank you very much. Thank you. And from uh, Japan, uh, Hiroyuki Akita. Thank you very much. Uh, my question more or less over uh, that of William, but uh, uh, it is to um, uh, Russian Deputy Minister. And as I understand, Russia favors a uh, multiple world order. And you also said that uh, we should improve Asian security system. So in this context, what is the strategic goal for Russia to expand its uh, security cooperation with ASEAN country? Uh, after World War II, uh, the order in this region 
uh, generally basically uh, has been led by the United States and its allies and partners. So does uh, Russia intend to alter or change this uh, security order to be more multipolar uh, one uh, through the security cooperation? And in this context, do you think that China is your partner or your rival or your competitor? Thank you. Thank you very much. And from uh, Malaysia, Nurulita Anwar. Thank you so much, John. Um, I wanted to ask a question to the Deputy Defense Minister from Russia. I wanted to state here, um, we note the decision uh, or the position taken by Russia in supporting the regime in Syria. But of course, um, it's quite well aware, well documented, that the regime remains complicit in the killing of unarmed civilians. So my, my point here, considering the developments in Astana, um, will Russia be prepared to do more to ensure a timely conclusion, considering there have been uh, safety zones and maps demarcating areas of disarmament, uh, was to be completed by May 22nd, eh, last May 22nd. And does this mean that Russia will be more willing to uh, basically transition from the current military assistance to the regime to a more lasting, meaningful humanitarian and peacekeeping efforts based on the war that has lasted uh, more than six years. So this probably be a question um, in terms of showcasing what Russia can and will do because certainly the military might of, of uh, Russia itself has tilted the balance in the regime's favor and in such an environment it usually uh, is not very useful in nurturing trust in negotiating efforts. Thank you. Thank you. And from uh, China, Chi Chao Zhu. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to express our condolence to the terrorism victims in UK, Philippines, and other areas in the world. We have addressed the global threats and new challenges during this year's dialogue, including traditional and non-traditional domains. I have two questions to General Fu Min. One is about the traditional. You mentioned that, which is our concern. Uh, what kind of new role Russia can play to keep the strategic stability in Northeast Asia, according to the new situation we are facing? Another is about non-traditional issue. Cybersecurity or information security has caused a great concern globally. What will uh, Russia do to collaborate with SCO and other countries, including China, to push forward the implementation of the code of conduct of international information. And China and Russia and other countries, we have submitted the draft of the code of conduct of informa uh, international information. And uh, will, what will Russia do to collaborate to push forward such uh, code of conduct implementation. Thank you. Thank you. And from uh, the UK, former Chief of the Defence Staff and Senior Advisor to the IISS, David Richards. Thanks, John. Um, there's been much talk at this conference of rules-based order, uh, but rules that don't reflect the realities of the contemporary world, that have not, for example, kept pace with the changing status of nations, the risks of cyber conflict or the rise of extremism and that some key nations perhaps don't agree with, it seems to me may not be worth very much. Uh, is it time for fresh strategies to be agreed? And I'm conscious we're, here we are, the International Institute of Strategic Studies. I've heard very little talk about strategy here. Uh, within time, perhaps different rules, perhaps, uh, that reflect these new realities. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll take uh, four more, uh, and then I'll invite in an organized way each of our three panelists uh, to answer the questions, which will inevitably have to be grouped uh, into um, tight bundles, and I'll try to assist uh, that grouping when the questions are completed. But next from uh, the U.S. and IISS, uh, Dana Allen. Dana, yeah, all right, let me just uh, pass, 
pass on to, uh, and yeah, is it working? No, it isn't. Let me just um, pass on to uh, Richard Lloyd Parry, and we'll come back to you if we can. Richard? Thank you. Uh, my question is for the ministers from New Zealand and Singapore. You both took part in the uh, ministers' meeting of the FPDA, and at the end of that meeting, you committed to updating the relevance of the FPDA. Could you tell us in concrete terms what that is going to mean? In other words, what sort of things will you be doing that you haven't done in the past, or what will you be doing more of? Mm. And what thought have you given to expanding participation by other countries in the FPDA and even adding new members? Thanks very much. Uh, Ernesto Bream. Thank you very much. Uh, I first would like to extend my sympathies to the uh, victims of the terror attack in London. Uh, my uh, question is directed to the Deputy uh, uh, Defense Minister of Russia. Um, often uh, big powers uh, deny that they have any leverage over smaller states, uh, particularly if those smaller states don't behave very well. We see that in the case of China regarding North Korea. So my question is um, whether Russia see, sees that it has any leverage over Syria, because the deputy minister elaborately mentioned uh, the support of Russia for uh, President Bashar al-Assad, and whether Russia will use that leverage to promote uh, respect for human rights um, in Syria by Bashar al-Assad, uh, al by the regime there. Thank you, and I'll go next to uh, Marcos uh, Robledo Hoker. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to thank all the invitation to participate in, in the dialogue this year on both for the WIS uh, and the Singapore government. Um, the question is for the panel. Uh, it's related to the, uh, if they can share uh, the vision they uh, have about the about how to uh, foster security cooperation among the two rims of the Pacific. Uh, if you take in consideration that, for instance, uh, both uh, Singapore and New Zealand, together with Brunei and Chile, launched the before that led to the TPP, maybe some creative uh, initiatives can be done uh, that finally have unexpected outcomes. So in the security realm, for instance, President Bachelet has shown interest on joining the ASEAN Regional Forum um, in order to develop a security dialogue uh, among the two rims in some way. So I would like very much to, to know how do you see this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to try Dana one more time and see if by chance the microphone works. Dana, is it working now? Not sure, is it? No, yeah, go. Okay, thank you. Um, no, I mean, if you press it off, it won't work. No, I haven't touched it. Never mind. All right, you withdraw. Yes, I withdraw. Thanks very much. All right, well, um, let me then um, invite uh, the panel to address the questions, and I'll do it in uh, this order. Uh, Mark Mitchell, uh, General Furman, and then Minister Ung. Um, and I would suggest uh, perhaps, um, uh, Mark Mitchell, you might want to address a bit um, the geoeconomic and, and geostrategy, since uh, TPP uh, is a relevant issue for uh, uh, for New Zealand, and perhaps if you'd like to address uh, your own perspective from New Zealand about the, the modernization of the five power uh, defense arrangements, and if there were a third issue you particularly uh, picked up on, then that would be uh, splendid. For General Furman, I would group the many questions that were asked to you uh, into these um, uh, five categories. One, what would Russia do about DPRK? Two, what is your real objection against THAAD? Third, what is your position on the dual freeze proposal uh, from uh, China? Fourth, what 
can the Astana process do about building peace in Syria? And fifth, what will be Russia's contribution to norm creation in cyber? And so if you could take 45 seconds for each of those five questions, uh, we will um, be crisply enlightened on the Russian position. And Minister Ong, uh, you were asked specifically about uh, the five power defense arrangements and about uh, Chile's uh, prospective uh, application uh, to the ASEAN Regional Forum, but you're the co-host here, so of course you have license uh, to answer any other question that you think uh, you want uh, to address. So with those rules of engagement for the remaining uh, 15 minutes and 30 seconds, uh, which will include my concluding remarks as well, could in I invite Mark Mitchell first. Thank you, John. So um, I'll come to the first question. Uh, very good question. How does New Zealand see um, uh, an economy and how is it linked to both external and internal security? We see it as a fundamental. Uh, we, we have a very strong focus um, and always have in making sure that we've got a strong growing economy. To, to do that, uh, we're focused on making a better public service, strengthening our public service. We've invested heavily into science and innovation. Um, we have... Uh, We've got, we focus on very good free trade agreements um, and a reduction in red tape. So we make it easier to, to actually, uh, for our businesses to actually continue to grow. Um, fundamentally, if you don't have a strong economy, if you don't have a, an economy that everyone can feel like they can participate in, then you create a situation through unemployment, through the use of drugs or alcohol, with the exposure to gangs, and of course, uh, in terms of international security, the radicalization of individuals that feel like they've been uh, left behind or aren't participating. So uh, we, we clearly identify that having a strong growing economy that's inclusive is a big part of making sure that we're able to manage our internal risks. Uh, in relation to the TPP, uh, TPP 11, we feel like the progress is going very well on that. Um, it's, at the moment we see that um, President Trump and the administration are reorganising their own trade policy, um, but certainly from New Zealand's perspective, we would welcome um, re-engagement uh, from the United States on TPP 11, and we see that um, you know these these free trade agreements are constantly being updated and re-looked at. So there's always opportunities in the future. Um, and the other thing around free trade agreements is that um, it also strengthens that uh, regional uh, interaction um, and and connectedness that. Um, that we look for through um, economic and, and defence policies. Uh, in relation to um, FPDA, this was my uh, first meeting as a newly appointed defence minister um, to meet with the FPDA, so I am going to defer to my senior colleague um, on some of the issues that were raised, but I would say that um, in terms of uh, a new focus, there's definitely been a focus now on counter-terrorism and maritime security. And the intent is to use the pre-programmed exercises to actually introduce those capabilities um, into what already the FPDA uh, is, is focused on and achieving. In terms of uh, membership, uh, we never discussed that, uh, but there was a strong discussion around uh, enhancing the program um, in terms of having observers uh, included in the program. And I think in the um, joint statement, there was a strong commitment to that. Maybe five, maybe something more uh, maybe five. Or, or less, I will conglomerate if you Thank don't you. mind that. Uh, as for, as my dear friends, as for question concerning the China in general, China it's a good country, if you don't know. <laughs> Big country, a very peaceful country. And uh, we are, and many, a lot of countries, including the United States of America, European countries, African countries, Asian countries, are working, cooperating with China, no problem. And we are working, and we will go on that, that way, no doubt. If you are meaning uh, China, uh, uh, South, um, if you're meaning South, Southeastern, uh, South China, um, uh, see problems. I will try to make some comments about the situation. That, that is our assessments or our 
analysis. I'd like to say that we very attentively are following the situation in South China Sea. And we consider it to be a significant factor in flu influencing security and stability in the whole Asia-Pacific region. Russia, fortunately, is not a side in the territorial disputes and conflicts in the South Ch Chinese Sea and will be never be involved, I hope so, into them. As a matter of principle, we are not taking either side. We are strongly convinced that involvement of the third party into this, into this dispute will only increase the tension in the region. All states involved in territorial disagreements in the South China Sea need to adhere the principle of the non-use of force and to continue to look for a diplomatic and political way of peaceful and way of peaceful resolution of the given problems on international, based on international legal basis, first of all, United Nations Convention on the Maritime Law dated 1982 and declaration signed by ADN countries and China in 2002 and supplement signed uh, and declaration of implementation guidelines signed in July 2011. We believe that consultations and negotiation of the territorial issues in the South China Sea should be conducted between the involved parties, I'm stressing that directly in the efficient form which they themselves had agree, have agreed on. We base our thoughts on the fact that the key to resolve the contradictions in the sub-region could become building a new security architecture in the region and supported by collective non-aligned principles and norms of international Low. And we propose all the partners to take part in the implements of the Russian initiatives of development of the security framework guidelines and cooperation within the Asia-Pacific region. As for our part, as for Russia, we'll continue to support the efforts of China and Asian countries to elaborate a code of conduct in South China C. Uh, concerning to the third elements, in other words, ballistic defense missile, we are very alarming about that fact. Not only concerning the peninsula, Korean peninsula, but yes, concerning to the same activities on the Japan territory, and the same in European. If you didn't know the fact that the Russia is concerned, not only Russia, a lot of countries are concerned by that military equipment and military specialists sitting here, they know that it's not only ballistic missile defense system, but yes, it has dual function it can launch attack missile, big distance. That is why we are alarming. And it's direct threat to the Russia from the Romania, Poland, Turkey, some other countries of the Europe, from the territory of Korean Peninsula, from the territory of Japanese, because it's very close to the Russian Kurila Islands. You know that. And uh, as for Korea Peninsula, a problem, we are insisting to look for the peaceful 
once again the diplomatic and economical road to solve this problem. Because increasing the rates of armament, including such a tech and very big and very powerful armament like Thad, the same, we are convinced that will increase the tension in the region. And the North Korean should be provocated to attack. We must to stop that tension, that raise of the tension. That is our uh, principal position. We do not understand why uh, anybody do not understand us. And we insist And we think that economical restrictions should be a kind of tool to involve the North Korea to peaceful process of uh, resolving of that dispute on con conflict and not to deteriorate once again the economical situation in North Korea. It's another position. As for Syria, in global, uh, in, yeah, close call. I, 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 I like to, uh, uh, we're in brief to tell that uh, Syria remains where is the mine forces are concentrated and the control of the militant groups is conducted, including by the Russian troops. I should make, I try to make to you to remember that the Russian mainly uh, airspace forces are situated, are stayed in a Syrian territory by the formal official invitation from the legal Syrian government. And uh, we would like to remind the ISIS bandits and groups of bandits was born in Iraq. And when the active Iraqi army was dismissed, about 100 of thousand people formed the backbone of the terrorist groups. Currently, ISIS is a separate state, which, held, which has all the features of a country, even its own ministry, of taxes. Terrorists are armed, I should remind to you, with the latest and sophisticated weaponry, electronic warfare, and reconnaissance. Meanwhile, ISIS create their sales, recruiting students and in universities and institutes, including on the Russian territory. And we are fighting that. And answering the question that the Russian troops are committing and killing innocent people, innocent people in Syria, sometimes it happens, but not by Russian. You know that, and Iraq and in Syria the same. As for, you know the fact, not as was the fact, it was the uh, situation uh, falsification of chemical attack, so-called chemical attack by made so-called uh, by Syrian government in Khan Sheikhoun, it's a full falsification. Okay. And uh, answering the question, why we love such much uh, Bashar Assad? We love anybody, any president of any country. Somebody didn't love ex-president killed President Gaddafi. Now, no Gaddafi, no Libya. Somebody didn't love ex-president Saddam Hussein, president of Iraq. Now, no Saddam Hussein, no Iraq. Somebody didn't like Assad. Saddam didn't like Yemen president, and, and so on, so on. We do not assist this policy. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy uh, Defense Minister. And I hand over to our host, Defense Minister Ung. Thank you, John. There were a number of questions um, which I think have a common strand in uh, the 
I thank uh, Mr. Delgado for his uh, remarks on uh, supporting this strong, if not inextricable, linkage between trade and security. And a question from uh, Mr. Richards on the rule-based order and on FPDA. I think there's a common strand in all of these, and uh, that tight linkage, or that, uh, uh, in my speech where I said, the virtuous balance between security and economic uh, progress. Uh, I think the heart of it is uh, what uh, Dr. Kissinger replied in his uh, reference in his book is legitimacy. What is the basis of acceptance of countries, of uh, alliances, whether economic or military or both, and sustainability of these uh, acceptable rules? And this is a region, uh, many of you are historical, uh, uh, steep in history. You recognize this region has seen various models, with various configurations, whether it was as tribute states, whether it was colonies, or whether it was different forms of uh, dominance. Uh, it's interesting that um, I sometimes compare what happens in Munich Security Dialogue and uh, over the last few years where Germany is an economic power and for the longest time uh, was accepted as that, and, but in recent years, Germany asked to play a greater role as a security partner. And I think uh, that is evolving even now. Uh, I think the United States fully understands that, and Secretary Mattis has said that from a security point of view, their presence, their commitment is uh, unquestionable. On the trade side of the house, give them a little bit longer, uh, and they believe in free trade, but fair trade. And uh, we're just stating uh, what is happening now. Uh, it is uh, obvious, obvious to all in Asia that China is now the largest trading partner and also has its security concerns. So it's not an a easy solution to, to find that balance, but I think the heart of that question is legitimacy. And that also applies uh, uh, to uh, other alliances. For example, the question was asked about FPDA, whether uh, how we updated it. And specifically, we had updated it uh, to include counterterrorism and maritime security. But the legitimacy and the remit of FPDA isn't questioned because there was a historical antecedent, and that was solely for the protection of Malaysia and Singapore. And if you change the remit, I think you would invite suspicion and that you would also uh, uh, erode your legitimacy. Uh, there was a question on ADMM Plus uh, membership. Uh, we took a more pragmatic view, it's different from the ARF, uh, because from the defense track, uh, slightly different from uh, what you mentioned, Minister Ricardo, P4, where Chile was involved, and then that's now gone on to TPP 11 or TPP. Uh, for the ADM side of the house, we had actually troop exercises to concern about, so uh, the physical uh, um, aspects, and we wanted uh, 10 plus 8, because that was manageable. In principle, obviously, we would love to expand that and link up with other uh, re regional groupings and other nations, because that would increase, that would be more inclusive and uh, promote stability, but it's a practical concern. Finally, a question on what the assessment of the TPP-11. Uh, I said it took six years for the negotiations, and individual countries from the tpp or original 12 members, you should, one should recognize that individual countries and some countries make great concessions in, in, into evolving an agreed agreement, uh, some to the point of having ratification by their parliaments and understanding uh, the benefits and, and what they would have to uh, quit pro quo, if you like. Uh, Japan is a, a very good example, and despite the U.S. pulling out, Japan is pushing on ahead, as with Australia, as with uh, other countries, and New Zealand as well. So uh, it's early days yet, but there are some um, indications for optimism, but uh, uh, I think we'll have to wait to see how it evolves. Thank you very much.
Minister Ung, uh, thank you very much, and um, I hope all of you will thank me and uh, will join me in thanking uh, the three panelists for their uh, presentations just now. Um, and allowed me to bring this Shangri-La um, dialogue uh, to a conclusion uh, by summarizing um, uh, the five themes I think that were discussed here, provide five statistics about the Shangri-La dialogue, provide five sets of thanks, uh, and give you the date for next year's Shangri-La dialogue. I think uh, the five themes that uh, were the most prominent in this year's Shangri-La dialogue were first, uh, the persistent and uh, malign threat of international terrorism. Uh, second, uh, the difficult uh, challenge of dealing with the DPRK's uh, nuclear and ballistic uh, missile program. Uh, third, uh, the need to continue to maintain a rules-based order across a range of issues. Fourth, the important linkage and relationships between trade and security, and fifth and finally, uh, the importance of finding flexible ways to cooperate between states uh, within ASEAN and as between uh, a number of different states. Uh, flexible military cooperation between coalitions of the relevant uh, and the willing uh, is an important way forward. My five statistics are that there were 48 countries represented at this year's Shangri-La Dialogue, 504 total delegates, 81 bilateral meetings booked by the IISS and many more booked by the nations concerned, 6,234 badges printed, that gives you an indication of the amount of people who were somehow engaged in making this dialogue a success, and because we live in a digital age, these were the countries in which the hashtag SLD um, uh, trended number one. Hashtag SLD trended number one in Australia, India, Malaysia, Pakistan, Philippines, and the UK. And my five sets of thanks are, first of all, to the Ministry of Defense of uh, Singapore, our partner, uh, in the Shangri-La dialogue process, uh, to the Singapore Armed Forces, to the Singapore Police, to the RSIS, and fifth and finally, uh, to the IISS staff and interns who supported uh, the 504 delegates and the 6,234 people otherwise engaged in this activity. The Shangri-La dialogue will be held again next year, 2018, for us, that is a special year because 2018 is the 60th anniversary year of the IISS. So we will look for a very inclusive, rich, defense minister-led uh, Shangri-La dialogue, which will include all the core participants from the ASEAN regional forum countries, but will also allow for that flexible participation that is sometimes difficult in formal uh, uh, institutions, so if uh, we have more countries from the four Pacific Alliance countries with uh, a Mercosur member as well, that is something we will welcome while maintaining the core uh, membership of the Shangri-La Dialogue to those uh, ASEAN Regional Forum countries and those affiliated to it. And the date uh, for the 2018 Shangri-La Dialogue are 1 to 3 June, where we hope many of you will help us to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, the 60th anniversary of the IISS, and the 17th iteration of the Shangri-La Dialogue. Thank you very much, and have a safe travels home. <laughs>